Welcome to the U.S. Water Prize 2021 Ceremony. I'm O.J. McFoy, Chair of the U.S. Water Alliance Board of Directors and General Manager of the Buffalo Sewer Authority. It is my pleasure to kick off this year's ceremony, and I'm excited to celebrate the 2021 Class of U.S. Water Prize winners. To all the folks tuning in, I'm glad you can join us. We will also share about the winners on social media, so if you'd like to join the conversation online as well, please use hashtag U.S. Water Prize in your post. This year, we have nine winners across eight award categories, including two new categories, Outstanding Rising One Water Leader and Outstanding Artists. We'll be hearing from the winners today in three panel discussions, but first, I want to share a little bit about the U.S. Water Prize. For 10 years, the U.S. Water Alliance has been awarding the U.S. Water Prize. The prize celebrates outstanding achievement in the advancement of sustainable, integrated, and inclusive solutions to our nation's water challenges. Winners are recognized for their exemplary efforts to secure a one water future for all. This year's class of winners join a cohort of outstanding organizations and individuals that are driving change in the water sector. The 2021 winners exemplify the diversity of the One Water Movement, and I am proud to celebrate their achievements today. We are grateful for all their contributions. Before we dive into the program, I'd like to cue up a video introducing our winners and their work. This video will give you a sense of the projects that our winners are leading. We hope you enjoy. For the past decade, the U.S. Water Alliance has awarded the U.S. Water Prize to exemplary One Water leaders. The U.S. Water Prize celebrates outstanding achievement in the advancement of sustainable, integrated, and inclusive solutions to the nation's water challenges. This year, the Alliance is celebrating nine winners. In 2021, the Alliance added two new categories, Outstanding Artist and Outstanding Rising One Water Leader. These winners join leaders from six other categories that demonstrate the diversity of the One Water Movement. The Alliance is delighted to introduce this year's class of U.S. Water Prize winners and hopes their work serves as an inspiration to all. U.S. Water Prize Public Sector Winner Tucson Water. Tucson Water is taking a holistic approach to managing Tucson's water resources. After 100 years without flowing water, Tucson Water's Santa Cruz River Heritage Project reintroduced water to the Santa Cruz Riverbed. Tucson Water developed a proposal for a green stormwater infrastructure fee and three-year pilot program, which was approved unanimously by the City Council and Tucson Water is replenishing the area's aquifer with reclaimed water through the South Houghton Area Recharge Project. U.S. Water Prize, Private Sector Winner, Microsoft. Microsoft's comprehensive water program is helping to foster integrated approaches to sustainable water resource management across the country and the world. Through Microsoft's 2030 Water Positive Commitment, the company has committed to replenish more water than it uses, provide 1.5 million people with access to clean water and sanitation services, and reduce water use intensity across its operations. Microsoft is achieving this goal by investing in water projects in water-stressed regions where the company operates. The company's new Silicon Valley campus, for example, will be among the first large office buildings in the world to be certified by a third party as a net zero water facility, enabling 100% of non-potable water to come from recycled sources. U.S. Water Prize, nonprofit winner, San Juan Bay Estuary Program. The San Juan Bay Estuary Program, or Estuario, is dedicated to restoring and conserving the quality of the waters of the estuary ecosystem. To advance its mission, Estuario launched the only long-term strategy on the island for detecting and correcting illicit discharges. Since 2018, the Illicit Discharges Detection and Elimination Project 
has corrected 87% of cases identified. Estuario's integrated, community-led approach to restoring water quality is a hallmark of its success. U.S. Water Prize Cross-Sector Partnership Winner KC Water's Green Stewards Program The Green Stewards Program provides training for Kansas City, Missouri residents who face barriers to employment. KC Water partnered with Bridging the Gap, a local nonprofit organization to develop green stewards. The program provides participants with the education and experience needed for green stormwater infrastructure maintenance. Through the program, participants met personal development and growth milestones and logged over 5,800 field hours performing maintenance tasks and inspections. U.S. Water Prize, Outstanding Journalism on the Value of Water Winner. Ian James and colleagues, the Arizona Republic. Journalist Ian James, along with colleagues Rob O'Dell, Mark Henley, David Wallace, Nick Oza, and editor Sean McKinnon at the Arizona Republic, have devoted extensive work to spotlighting pressing water challenges in the state of Arizona. In the groundbreaking series, Arizona's Next Water Crisis, in 2019, James, O'Dell, and Henley exposed the unregulated nature of groundwater pumping throughout rural Arizona. In a series of articles published in 2020, James and colleague David Wallace reported on how the Hopi are struggling with a widespread lack of water infrastructure, the effects of climate change, and declining springs that they consider sacred. In another piece from 2020, James and colleague Nick Oza investigated the history of insufficient funding and systemic racism behind the lack of access for clean drinking water in many areas of the Navajo Nation. U.S. Water Prize Outstanding Public Official Winner Congresswoman Melanie Stansbury, New Mexico won. Prior to her election in 2021, to represent the 1st Congressional District of New Mexico, Representative Melanie Stansbury served as a state representative. As a state legislator, Representative Stansbury crafted and sponsored the Bipartisan Water Data Act, which was enacted to identify and integrate key water data across the state. The success of the act has attracted partnership opportunities and matching funds from the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation's Water Smart Program furthering its impact. Because of the Water Data Act, state agencies are now seeing steady improvements in how they manage and share their water data. U.S. Water Prize, Outstanding Artist Winners, Salmon Speakers, Friends of Gadsden Creek. Salmon Speakers came together to create When the Salmon Spoke, a project amplifying voices on both sides of the U.S.-Canada border and putting faces on the region's rivers, the Stikin, Taku, Yunuk, Nas, and Skeena. The Salmon Speakers process was Indigenous-led and story-centered. They hosted gatherings, story circles, and interviews in Southeast Alaska and Northern British Columbia. At the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the team quickly adapted their work moving from planning a live theatrical performance to a digital production. When the Salmon Spoke premiered in May 2020, featuring life stories of 10 indigenous citizens tied to the Stikine River. The production weaves together cinematic imagery and indigenous music and visual art. The Salmon Speakers also launched an accompanying web archive of community stories. Their work was supported by the Southeast Alaska Indigenous Transboundary Commission and arts organization Ping Chong and Company, along with Salmon Beyond Borders and Skeena Wild Conservation Trust. The story-sharing work of the Salmon Speakers continues in order to promote Indigenous sovereignty, equality, sustainability, food security, and food sovereignty in some of the world's last wild salmon watersheds. Friends of Gadsden Creek is a grassroots environmental justice campaign dedicated to opposing the destruction of the last remaining salt marsh ecosystem on the peninsula of Charleston, South Carolina. 
Friends of Gadsden Creek's artwork raises awareness of the acts of environmental racism inflicted upon Gadsden Green, the black community with the historical ties to the creek for over a century. The campaign's work includes creating infographics, organizing mutual aid efforts, hosting podcasts, and collaborating with local students. This work serves to highlight the resiliency of this community and its creek and envisions alternative futures that restore and revitalize a severed relationship to the water. U.S. Water Prize Outstanding Rising One Water Leader Winner Dr. Lindsay Burt As a Client Solutions Manager at Xylem, Dr. Lindsay Burt leads teams to develop data-driven approaches to address water challenges, including nutrient reduction, combined sewer overflows, and flood reduction. She is an outspoken advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the sector. Within Xylem, Dr. Burt has played an influential role in shaping the organization's inclusion initiatives. Her deep passion for water at every stage in the cycle and her ability to address systems in an integrated way are key elements of what makes a rising one water leader. Watching that video has me looking forward to hearing more from our winners. But I have one more video I'd like to share before we begin our program. To show our winners how proud the water sector is of their leadership, we have a special video message from individuals across the sector. To this year's winners, your dedication to your work, particularly in such a deeply challenging year, is inspirational. While we wish we could toast and celebrate you in person, we hope you enjoy this next video. Here's to the 2021 class of winners. Hello, I'm Roger Wolf. I'm the director of Iowa Soybean Association Research Center for Farming Innovation. I'm really thrilled to be here today to talk to you about the U.S. Water Prize award winners in 2021. Last year, we were the recipient of the outstanding nonprofit organization. And the U.S. Water Prize really puts a spotlight on the actions that are being taken to realize a one water future. This is really important. One of the reasons I think Iowa Soybean Association was selected was our work to build bridges between agriculture and farmers and urban interest to realize a one water future. So congratulations to the award winners. You're all helping us realize a one water future. I'm Kyle Dreyfus Wells, Chief Executive Officer of the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. As a member of the U.S. Water Alliance Board of Directors, I want to congratulate this year's class of U.S. Water Prize winners. These honorees show the diversity of the One Water Movement, and we couldn't be prouder to celebrate each of you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Al Cho from Xylem, and I'm a U.S. Water Alliance Board member. Congratulations to all of this year's U.S. Water Prize winners. Thank you for your leadership and dedication to One Water. Special shout out to Dr. Lindsay Burt, whose vision and talent give me hope for the future. Thanks again and congratulations to you all. Hi, I'm Hank Havick, an Alliance board member and one of the founders of the Water Finance Exchange. I just wanna personally congratulate all our U.S. Water Prize winners this year. Despite the odds, you've broken down the stovepipes and proved what partnerships can achieve at the local level. We're proud of you, keep persevering. Hi everybody, I'm David Beckman, the president of the Pisces Foundation. And I'm Jose Aranda, Water Program Associate here at Pisces. And on behalf of all of us here, we wanted to congratulate all of the winners of the 2021 U.S. Water Prize. Thank you. We're very inspired by your work. Thank you for everything that you do. Hello, everyone. My name is John Take, and I serve as Stantec's Executive VP for Water. We're really proud to support all aspects of the U.S. Water Alliance, and I'm honored to currently serve on the board. This year's class of U.S. Water Prize winners shows the wonderful diversity of our One Water movement, and we couldn't be prouder to celebrate with each of you. So congratulations to everyone, and a special tip of the hat to my hometown utility, Tucson Water. Great job, everybody. Hello from Philadelphia. I'm Maggie Rakazina from Springpoint Partners. It is an honor to congratulate each of the winners of the U.S. Water Prize. 
We are proud of your leadership in addressing our nation's water challenges, and we are deeply inspired by this year's class of winners. Thank you for all that you do. Hi, I'm Cindy Wallace Lage, president of the water business for Black and Beach, and also a board member for the U.S. Water Alliance. I'm here to say congratulations to the U.S. Water Prize winners. We are proud of your leadership in addressing the nation's water challenges. Thank you for all that you've done and thank you for all that you will continue to do. Congrats. Welcome to the Flint Development Center. My name is Shelly Sparks. I'm the executive director and our award-winning project was the McKenzie Patrice Crew Water Testing Lab. We are the 2020 cross-sector category winners and we would like to congratulate the 2021 Water Prize, U.S. Water Prize class and we would like to thank you and congratulate you. You are helping to build a one water. Hi, I'm Yovan G, Program Officer at the Kresge Foundation, which is a U.S. Water Alliance funder. We are deeply inspired by this year's class of U.S. Water Prize winners. Thank you for all that you do. Hello, I'm Susan Moisio, Jacobs Global Director for Water, and a member of the U.S. Water Alliance's One Water Council. Congratulations to the U.S. Water Prize Class of 2021 winners. You're helping build a One Water future. Congratulations, U.S. Water Prize winners. We are proud of your leadership in addressing the nation's water challenges. Congratulations to the 2021 U.S. Water Prize winners. You're truly building a sustainable one water future. Congratulations once again to our winners. I'm delighted to turn the mic over to Sarah Emanzada, who's helping us build our one water movement as vice president of partnership and serving as our MC for today. Thanks again for tuning in. You're in for a great show. Sarah? Thank you, OJ, for kicking off the ceremony and congratulations on becoming the new chair of the U.S. Water Alliance Board of Directors. We are grateful for your leadership and I'm so glad you could join us for today's celebration. And welcome to all those who are tuning in live right now. I'm excited for you to get to know this year's class of outstanding winners. Before we dive into today's program, I wanna thank our Leader Circle for sponsoring this year's U.S. Water Prize. American Water, Black & Beach, Evoqua, Jacobs, Stantec, and Xylem. Without your generous support, the U.S. Water Prize would not be possible. Thank you again. To begin our ceremony, we have a special video from Congresswoman Melanie Stansberry, who represents New Mexico's first congressional district. Congresswoman Stansberry is this year's recipient of the Outstanding Public Official Award for her work as a water champion in New Mexico's state legislature. Hello, U.S. Water Alliance friends. This is Congresswoman Melanie Stansberry, and I want to say it is such an incredible honor to be recognized for this amazing award. I have spent my entire life working on water issues and I cannot tell you how touched and honored I am to be recognized alongside such amazing water champions all across the United States. As we know, we are facing a climate crisis in the United States and all across the world, and water is ground zero for this crisis on the ground. So many of our communities are already being impacted by changing hydrology and by the impacts, especially to communities that have been left behind or disproportionately impacted by social justice, economic and environmental issues over our history. This is especially true in New Mexico, in my home state, where we're facing prolonged drought, the impacts of climate change, reductions in snowpack, and communities that still are without safe drinking water, especially across our tribal communities, our Diné Navajo chapters, and a number of communities that have aging infrastructure and are struggling to bring water to homes and to their fields. So it is so important that we honor and recognize and do the work to fight for our communities and ensure that we're addressing the climate impacts to our water systems and rebuilding our water infrastructure in a more resilient and a more sustainable and a more just and equitable way. So that is why I've spent my career dedicated to these issues. That is what I am fighting for in Congress, 
And that is the work that I have spent doing as an educator, as a researcher in the state legislature and the work that I am doing right now in Congress advocating for our communities as part of these big reconciliation and infrastructure packages that we are trying to pass right now. I am determined to make sure that our communities and their water needs are made and that we ensure we are addressing the climate resilience of our nation and of our planet. Today, I'm working in Congress to make these transformative investments to get these bills across the finish line. And that is why I was also so proud to fight for and help pass the New Mexico Water Data Act, which is a transformative piece of legislation that we passed in New Mexico just a few years ago today. The fight continues and I am honored to stand shoulder to shoulder with you and so, so honored to be recognized for this amazing award. And I look forward to continuing to work with all of you as we fight for water justice in New Mexico and across the United States. Thank you for this incredible honor. Thank you and congratulations again, Congresswoman Stansbury. We greatly appreciate your dedication to building a sustainable water future. Now, I'd like to introduce you to the eight remaining winners in a series of panel discussions moderated by our special guests. Our first panel discussion will be moderated by Kathy Bailey. Kathy is the Executive Director for Greater Cincinnati Waterworks and is a member of the U.S. Water Alliance Board of Directors. She will be in discussion with the following distinguished panelists. Ian James, winner of the U.S. Water Prize for Outstanding Journalism on the Value of Water, he receives the award for his work alongside his colleagues at the Arizona Republic. Ian served as a climate and environment reporter for the Arizona Republic from 2018 to 2021 and now serves as water reporter for the Los Angeles Times. Representing Tucson Water, winner of the U.S. Water Prize for the Outstanding Public Sector Organization is John Kameek, Interim Director for Tucson Water. Previously, John was a member of the Tucson Water Team, assisting in advancing programs such as the Central Arizona Project, Recharge and Recovery. And representing Casey Waters Green Stewards Program, winner of the U.S. Water Prize for Outstanding Cross-Sector Partnership is Lisa Treese, Senior Landscape Architect for Casey Waters Smart Sewer Program. Lisa has been with the City of Kansas City, Missouri since 2012. Thank you, Sarah, for serving as our wonderful MC today. I'm glad to be a part of the celebration and to be in conversation with these three leaders. First off, congratulations on once again on your team's receipt of the U.S. Water Prize Award. Your work is incredibly valuable to the sector, and I'm excited to hear more about your accomplishments. I'm hoping we can address three questions today that get at lessons that can be learned from your work. And in the interest of time, let's kick off those questions now. John, can you tell us what does authentic partnership mean to you in your work? And what do you see as the key elements? Thank you, Kathy. And first and foremost, I wanna thank the US Water Alliance for recognizing Tucson Water. This is a great honor for us and, and we're so glad to be a part of this organization and this award really means a lot to us. So when we think about authentic partnership, authentic partnerships to me mean that your partner is invested in the vision in the objective of the project that you're working on or being proposed. Um, a great authentic partner is one that is willing to meet and discuss the project with you frequently, provide that in-kind support, ideally throughout the duration of the project, promote the concept of the project with you equally while maintaining that shared vision of where you wanna to get to. This could also involve social media posts, being present at community meetings with you, or helping to build consensus among those that are interested in the project altogether. One example that I can share, and it involves our heritage project, uh, which is the project where we bought, brought water back to the Santa Cruz River in downtown Tucson using our recycled uh, uh, reclaimed water. And that's, we had a tremendous partner and supporter from the University of Arizona, Dr. Michael Bogan. He started taking and posting beautiful pictures of life returning to the river on an almost daily basis. His enthusiasm alone, I'm confident and my colleagues are confident, opened up the exposure to the project in a way that we had not anticipated across the community. He has been a tremendous partner and continues to be so today. Great, thank you. Ian, 
As a journalist reporting on water in Arizona and other parts of the Western U.S., what have you found are some of the biggest issues in how water is managed? Thanks, Kathy. Well, for one thing, I think as we've seen, climate change means water change and how we deal with the more intense water cycle, including drying of much of the Western United States will be one of the defining challenges of our times. And one of the issues I've sought to focus on in my reporting is unsustainable groundwater use. In many areas of Arizona, uh, groundwater is being overpumped and water levels are falling. This is not unique to Arizona, but uh, in most rural areas of the state, it's quite simply a problem of overusing what we have. And heavy groundwater pumping has contributed to the, de the decreasing flows in rivers and streams. And I've also focused on reporting on the consequences for rural communities where some people have found their wells run dry. And then also, uh, I've tried to look at major inequities in terms of water infrastructure. Uh, so in addition to people who are struggling in rural communities with their wells uh, you know, losing water supplies, we've also reported on the widespread deficiencies in basic water infrastructure in indigenous communities where many people still live without tap water or with contaminated water. And I see these problems as being critically important and solutions are overdue. And my hope is that through our journalism, we can help shine light both on the problems and on the potential solutions. Great, thank you for that. Yes, we, we need many to shed light on some of the problems we have so we can have collective solutions. Lisa, in working on cross-sector partnership, what does authentic partnership mean to you and what do you see are the key elements? Um, so I want to thank U.S. Water Alliance also. Um, we're really excited about this award. This is Casey Waters' first award, and um, just thank you. Uh, this is great. Also want to thank all of our partners um, and staff that have worked on this and helped to make our Green Stewards program um, a success and a growing success. We still have a long way to go, but we're um, you know proud of where we've come so far. So back to the question um, on authentic partnership. He is where you have trust, um, respect, and also uh, communication between the partners. And in our case, a cross-sector partnership, with our partnership with Purdue the Gap, we were able to extend what was possible. So just our organization trying to do it alone would have been very challenging, but with that um, partnership in place, they were able to do complementary services to what we can offer. So um, for example, we set the framework for the program to talk about um, you know, what the goals were of the program. We set the funding and the purpose, but then Bridging the Gap was able to do, or they're still doing and continue to do, the day-to-day -day implementation, um, providing continuous feedback to participants and building those really personal relationships with the participants. That would be challenging for Casey Water to do um, at because we're at different scales. So. Um, yeah, that, that's what I think it means to me. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for that. And kudos to you on the first award. I'm sure there will be many more to come. Let's continue with some other questions. Ian, what is one of the greatest challenges that you and your colleagues have faced in your reporting, and how did you overcome it? Thank you, Kathy. Well, I would also like to add that my colleagues and I at the Arizona Republic are very honored to uh, have our work recognized with this award. And one of our biggest challenges in reporting on water in Arizona over the past few years has involved working with state data. When I moved to Arizona in 2018, I really wanted to investigate the problem of groundwater depletion in areas where pumping isn't regulated at all. So I requested the state's data on groundwater levels measured in thousands of wells. And my request to the State Department of Water Resources eventually brought us all of the state's water level data for more than 3,000, or rather 33,000 wells, and including some records going back more than a century. And we also uh, obtained more, nearly 250,000 well drilling records. And that's where the heavy lifting began in looking at that data. And my colleague, Rob O'Dell, a data and investigative journalist at the Republic, 
did tremendous work analyzing the data, which showed the effects of overpumping are widespread and worsening, and also helped point us to some of the areas with real problems where water levels have dropped in some areas, uh, actually in many areas, more than 100 feet since they were drilled, and in some areas more than 200 feet, uh, a major loss of water that, uh, you know, many that that uh, these communities uh, can depend on for the future, but it's diminishing. So that was one of the challenges that we've faced and uh, worked on through collaboration and uh, just a lot of hard work. Thank you for that, Ian. You're speaking my language. I'm always trying to look at the data. So I'm glad to hear that you're using it um, to help solve some of these challenges that we have. Lisa. What is one of the greatest challenges that you and your organization have faced in running the Green Stewards Program, and how did you overcome it? Um, I, you know, our, our biggest challenge has really been, you know, the last 18 months working under, you know, worldwide pandemic. Um, for sure, that's kind of up the ante of challenges. Um, but our kind of consistent challenges we've had over the four years of the program have been keeping to our purpose making sure that we stay focused on what is our goal? Why are we doing this program? You know, our, our purpose here is to build the green infrastructure workforce and to provide opportunities for new careers for our residents. So we have to stay focused on that and not get distracted by shiny things and start to look, you know, other places. Um, you know, it's that's, that's our biggest challenge. Um, one way that we help kind of make sure that we're staying on that task is our contract is renewed each year and we write a new scope. So, you know, we adjust the scope each year and that gives us a chance to really fine tune. So if we're finding that some things, maybe the prior year we thought would work great and we tried them and maybe it didn't pan out the way we hoped, we go back and adjust the scope. And then our next year we can kind of get ourselves refocused. Great, great to hear that. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you say we're, you're keeping to your purpose and that um, you take time to, to refocus because often it's so much that we need to do um, that we can often get off of focus. So I'm glad to hear you say that. John, what is one of the greatest challenges that your team at Tucson Water has faced and how did you overcome it? Okay, uh, well, in launching any project uh, at Tucson Water, we often find that one of our greatest challenges is to make sure that we've reached all the interested stakeholders that this project would be near or around and those stakeholders, whether they're for or against uh, the project. So finding out who will react positively or negatively to your project does take a lot of work. Most water utilities may not be prepared to do that when they, when they come up with a, a community project. As a public utility though, one rule that we always follow is to engage your mayor and council offices early and often. Um, they can often help tremendously in pointing out who in their ward or district may be supporters of this project or just need to be aware uh, that the water utility will be doing something unique. Uh, this saves can save an incredible amount of time and pain, especially if you have all the stakeholders identified with it, with your community leadership ahead of time. One of the last things you wanna do uh, is, uh, is a group is that you may have overlooked and it comes out against your project that starts to put pressure on your elected leadership or your utility board for the direction that project is going, even if it's only at the concept level. So that you don't want that to, to end up upsetting the goal and the mission of the project that's there. So doing that upfront work on any project to identify the local stakeholders we think is key when we're launching any project like this. That is so true. Thank you for sharing that, John. All right, I have a few more questions. I hope you're still with me to answer just a few more. Um, let's go to Lisa. Lisa, from your perspective working at KC Water, what can the water sector learn from other sectors? Or what can other sectors learn from those working in water? So on, on this question, I, I pondered a little bit of the best way, you know, I, I was trying to think, what do I know about other sectors? And, you know, I, I guess it made me realize I need to learn more about some of the other sectors out there. Um, but one of the things that really inspired uh, the Green Stewards program was the concept of kind of apprenticeships. So earn and learn, um, not asking someone to jump through hoops and hoops and still not be getting paid. Um, so that was kind of the foundational idea. So this 
these positions are full-time pay, they have benefits, you know, they're, it's something where you can, you know, it's, you can support your, you know, your life to a a modest level, but have health insurance and and confidence. You have some vacation days and sick leave um, while learning a skill. So then you can build on it for your next, next role. Um, I think we can learn so much about uh, using apprenticeships. So in the water sector, you know, I mean, to me, if we had more of those, we could bring more people in and not have, you know, as many barriers that people have to pass through. So, um, yeah, I'd say that does it. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. Thank you for, for thinking of that and sharing that with John. Same question. From what, from your perspective, working at Tucson Water, what can the water sector learn from other sectors or what can other sectors learn from those working in water? Yeah, that's a great question, Kathy. Uh, what I enjoy learning, I think, most from the private sector is brand marketing. Many think uh, that as a water utility, you have a natural monopoly. So why would you need to market your product? I think you do it because you are a monopoly. You have to live up to those expectations of excellent service and high quality product every day. So in the water world, we sell a very intimate product. It is inside everyone's home. It is used for bathing, drinking, making formula for an infant, for an infant, etc. So it is a very personal product. So upholding and securing that brand is always of the utmost importance. If you do it well, you will find support for rate adjustments may come easier when you have to do that. And because you have demonstrated you are trusted in the community, not only from a product quality of service standpoint, but hopefully by being fiscally responsible as well. And hopefully if you do it well, you can provide that insight to the private sector as well by being a good community partner takes the effort and work. But if you do it effectively, you can generate brand loyalty that can assist your business in meeting its goals for success as well. Thank you, John, for sharing that. That is so true. We often forget about the branding part of what we do in the water industry. So that is so true. Thanks for sharing. Ian, In what ways do you think journalism can serve the public in helping to spotlight water solutions? Well, I think journalism can help reveal problems that ought to be addressed and also highlight what's working. And that includes looking at inequities and injustices in water infrastructure and in places that uh, rely on a small water system or don't have a water supplier. Also, mismanagement of water resources, I think, is an important area of focus. And in some cases, the complete lack of management that leads to overuse and depletion. And I think uh, journalism can play a vital role in examining threats also to aquatic ecosystems in our rivers and wetlands, because as the climate gets hotter and more extreme, rivers and streams all over the West are undergrowing pressures. And I see journalism playing an important role in explaining the science. I also think there is important journalism to be done focusing on water and climate solutions. And I believe that through our reporting, we can help focus on where the status quo just isn't enough and where changes are needed. Thank you, Ian, for sharing that. I'm looking forward to more journalists partnering, partnering with us in the, in the industry. So as we close out this session, I just want to say thank you again for representing your colleagues in this discussion and for your team's commitment to driving the sector forward. It is a joy to be able to celebrate your work and you all should be very proud of this award. Congratulations again. You all are leading by example and I know more good work is yet to come from you. I'm looking forward to hearing from our next panelist and I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy, Ian, John, and Lisa. It was great to hear about your work and congratulations once again. Our next panel discussion will be moderated by Benny Starr, the Alliance's artist in residence. Through his residency, Benny is working with our staff and the entire Alliance network to infuse arts and cultural strategies into our thinking, problem solving, and programming. Benny is joined today by the winners of the Outstanding Artist Award. Tis Peterman, representing the Salmon Speakers team, is Special Projects Consultant with the Southeast Alaska Indigenous Transboundary Commission. The commission represents 15 of the 19 federally recognized tribes in Southeast Alaska. Mary Coaster, 
Director of Project Draw for Science and Kids Teaching Flood Resilience at the University of South Carolina Center for Science Education, will be representing Friends of Gadsden Creek, alongside Tamika Gadsden, a Charleston, South Carolina-based activist, podcast host, and Twitch streamer. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you all today. Your work is inspirational, and I'm looking forward to talking more with you about your artistic processes. Uh, both Salmon Speakers and Friends of Gaston Creek are being recognized today for their creativity in driving a more equitable water future. Through different mediums, these artists are building greater awareness and are also creating new solutions to deeply rooted issues. I have a few questions for you all so our audience can get to know your work a little better. If you all don't mind, we'll have you take turns in responding to these questions. The first question uh, that I have is for Tis. What water challenges does your work seek to address? Um, right now, we're seeking to address the transboundary mining threats uh, from BC into uh, Southeast Alaska. The headwaters of three major rivers are being threatened by mining resources extractment in BC. Thank you for that answer, Tis. And this next question is for Mary. What water challenges does your work seek to address? Thank you for the opportunity, um, Benny, to, to talk about that. I think uh, the only way I can answer that question is as the teacher activist who seeks to make education matter in ways that aren't just about my students getting the right answer on a standardized test, but instead to sort of afford them opportunities to see what's happening in plain sight and why it matters to develop a deep relationship with the water. I'll give you an example. Not one single student with whom I worked in the four K-12 schools um, in the Gaston Creek watershed even knew that this critical wetland was right across the street from their home and their schools, much less that it had been the center of the culture, commerce, and recreation of the largest African-American community on the peninsula of Charleston. And then to have it all taken away from the city covered with trash and reclaimed for commercial use for massive corporate Game. To a person, they asked, why didn't we know any of this stuff before? And so for this, for today, I put together a synthesis of the discussions with the 13 year olds who heard the story for the first time. And here's what they said. Whoa, what you mean? This whole area used to belong to us. Our families own homes right on a huge salt marsh like rich people. We had riverfront property and businesses here. Our families were baptized in this creek and it was beautiful. And we were allowed to swim in it and fish and shrimp there too. You're saying they took all that from us and all the flooding we're having now is the creek's fault and now it has to die? Enough already. So as you saw in the art they produced, these students were releasing their natural affinity for questioning as scientists and as artists. And then they went on a quest to find evidence to support the claim that not only did the creek matter, but they did too. Thank you so much for that, Mary. Thank you for sharing those words from your students as well. Mika, the same question for you. What water challenges does your work seek to address? Yeah, um, thank you so much for having uh, me here. Um, I'm, uh, I feel honored uh, to be here on this call to share more about the work that the Friends of Gadsden Creek Collective is leading in Charleston, South Carolina. I think mo most succinctly, Benny, to answer the question, um, we're confronting environmental racism, historic um, environmental racism that has been that has been visited upon a community of, of uh, Black and Gullah Geechee descendants um, for for generations. Um, that's the most succinct answer. What I'm also hoping to do, um, uh, as a compliment to the other contributors from the collective, like Mary, who apply a very um, important scientific lens to the work. Um, I'm I'm very excited and enthusiastic about making sure that the work that we lead has the critical race analysis that's often missing 
um, in philanthropy and also in a lot of advocacy groups that uh, focus on conservation or environmental issues, especially in, in the low country of South Carolina. Um, African Americans, black and brown people, bye bye people in general, disabled people, poor people often um, are left out of the conversation. And so but I hope that the work that we lead at Friends of Gadsden Creek um, serves as a model for other communities on how to combat uh, environmental racism and do it in a way that centers those most affected by the injustice. I couldn't agree more, Mika. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that with us today. And I want to stay with that um, because we're talking about community. We're talking about specific people and centering people in, in so much of this work. And I want to ask this question to Tis. Can you tell us about how you engage community members in your artistic process? Well, this is such a big issue with um, transboundary mining uh, because it affects both the First Nations in BC and uh, the tribes in the US side. So rather than pile on yet another heavy issue, and we weren't getting that big of a reaction from uh, a lot of people that we wanted to, we started reaching out to put a face on this river by interviewing um, Tall Pan people, which is north on the BC side, and Clinket people and Haida people on the US side of the border. And in that whole process, we discovered not only family members that we've um, been displaced by that border, but we heard stories that we had more in common than we had thought, as well as telling this history of the river that hasn't been told in such an artistic way in the middle of a pandemic. And in that first um, debut of our production, we reached out and had over a thousand listeners the first uh, debut in May of 2020. And it was done during the pandemic. It was supposed to be a live you know, uh, show and te people telling their stories that connected both sides of the border of um, Indigenous people. And it was, it wasn't the direction we were going, but it opened, widened our audience so much better than we had even hoped. Thank you so much for sharing that. Storytelling is such a powerful tool. It resonates with me a lot. And I love the fact how you touched on it wasn't supposed to be what it was, but you all allowed it to become what it was and it was still so impactful. Same question I'm going to then ask to you, Mary. Can you tell us about how you engage community members in your artistic process? Yeah, that was such a powerful testimony um, of Tissa's is how they, they acting as artists, they, they were let themselves be surprised by what could happen. Um, Likewise, in my own classes, I teach that art is can become a way of becoming actually who you are, while at the same time inviting you to lean into other perspectives. In my classes, we also acknowledge that just the act of making art is to make yourself vulnerable. It can be kind of scary. It can blow up in your face, right? In the process, you can bring your minds and your bodies and your spirit to the work and you feel what Tiss has said, this kind of bridging and connection that wouldn't have been there if you hadn't made this sort of messy thing together, right? So our art in Gadsden Creek is specifically directed to how we might use our art, whatever it may take to speak truth to power. I asked three questions of my students, whether they're science students or art students. What have you noticed? Do we go out in the field, into the place, into the contested space? What do you now know? And here's the biggie. What will you do? In other words, what art will you make that shows how you mm -hmm. feel about what you know? And then once I make those invitations, I just stand back and bear witness to the powerful, artful makings. To be more specific, say at the College of Charleston in my class at the Sustainability Literacy Institute, I made a very specific assignment. Here it goes. As you consider why flooding situations are often so much worse in low-income communities like Gadsden Green, show through your art that you have employed systems thinking. In other words, ask the following. 
what's connected to what in the Gaston Green situation, and what patterns change over time as well and cause and effect relationships are there. So that's your rubric to assess yourself. Now for my second graders working at Mitchell Elementary, we made on again in a pandemic because I wasn't able to go into the classroom um, myself. I have a heart condition. So we in a pandemic, this would have never happened, just like Tis said, we made this book together called Us in the Creek. And it was all about celebrating our relationship with these students who live in Gadsden Green about why this creek matters. And I want to show you how inspiring their art was. So to accompany the text, we know why you matter and why our community matters too. Look what they drew. Can you see it? A really strong, powerful, muscled arm next to a beautiful creek with a shrimp. Out of the mouth of babes. You know, our children have our clearest vision and I believe are our planet's most authentic artist. Thank you so much for sharing that, Mary. Mika, I want to ask you the same question. Um, can you tell us about how you engage community members in your artistic process? Sure. Um, one thing that um, I'm extraordinarily excited about and uh, sharing with this audience um, uh, is that recently the Friends of Gadsden Creek Collective um, partnered with a local art uh, gallery, the Redux Contemporary Art Gallery in Charleston. Um, and we currently have on display, um, on exhibition, title Futures. So for me, um, not only does this com combine art with an activist message, it required engagement, it required, uh, it required uh, outreach, building community, building relationship with actual residents of the Gas and Green Project. This is the, this is the area that we're working to protect. Um, uh, and so it was vitally important to the to the success of the exhibition, which is still still on till September 11th. Um, it's vitally important to include their contributions um, because what we want to do is want to make sure that our work is not paternalistic. Um, we want to make sure that they actually are given a platform or extended a platform to where they can outline and articulate uh, the grievances that they've had to navigate. Um, and so it's, it's really important to make sure they're part of the process. So when it, whenever we do mutual aid, Benny, whenever we, we do things like this art ex exhibition, um, we have to have the community involved hands on. And we also have to uh, create, create bridges. So that means that perhaps we provide stipends, perhaps we mm -hmm. ask them what they need, what needs they need to, that need to be met to make them more able to to show up in the spaces that we're trying to bring them into. Right, and and I think that's incredibly important. I want to stay on that. Yeah. I want to stay on that with you. I want to ask you, from your perspective, with the way you see with the way you see everything, and especially especially touching on the fact of not wanting the work to be paternalistic. Mm -hmm. How do you use that work? How do you use your work <laughs> to disrupt and challenge existing inequities? Yeah. You could elaborate. Ooh, how do I use my work to disrupt? Well, honestly, the the mere um the mere existence of being a black body in Charleston with this last name Gadsden is completely coincidental, but not coincidental <laughs> if you understand um uh, uh, Charleston's role in the transatlantic slave trade. Um I think the 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 mere um presence of someone like me in this body, a Gullah Geechee descendant, um defying um oppressive forces, um, refusing to shrink, refusing to be silenced by environmental racism. I think that in itself is a disruption. Um, I think also creating platforms or, or finding spaces like a Redux um, to where we can put the black experience, uh, we can position it, we can display it, we can we can talk about it, we can storytell about it. Putting it in a Redux to me is extraordinarily disruptive in a city that's hell bent on maintaining this patina of politeness I, as I as I phrase it. Um, we like to mm -hmm. pierce that bubble that people like to put themselves in through tourism and let them know, no, 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 there's an alternate re reality or rather there's a real, <laughs> there's an actual or, or more honest mm -hmm. reality that you need to make contact mm -hmm. with. And I think that our work, my work separately and our work as a collective of Friends of Gaz and Creek does that. Wow. And 
certain things I heard you say, your experience and just the, your presence and the storytelling, the way that you choose to tell that story, the honesty in it. I want to direct that same question to Tis. How do you use your work to disrupt and challenge existing inequities? I love her words, alternate reality, something we've all grown up with. And uh, what we have been doing in our work, which includes when the salmon spoke is shining a, a light on the disparities that indigenous people feel on both sides of the border. And more so um, that is happening today than ever before. But what we are also trying to do is tell stories and what's happening now as a result of our work is that we just met the other day with leaders from indigenous leaders from B, uh, BC and indigenous leaders from Alaska, Washington, Montana, and Idaho. And we'll have our third summit at the uh, right after Thanksgiving. So we're going to dive in. It seems like um, on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, that's out there in BC. It's coming to the US, but it seems like there's no platform for what it means to indigenous people. So what we're going to do is create that table for indigenous people to actually tell the governments exactly what that means to us and how we can protect the lands around us. I love that so much. I love what, what you said about creating that table and even expanding the, 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 the value of artists and the creations that artists put forward, creating that table to tell them what is needed I love that so much. And the final question I'm going to direct to, to, to Mary. You use the term staying with the trouble in your descriptions of what Friends of Gaston Creek is doing. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, kind of like what Tis said, building the table, right? Mm -hmm. The phrase staying with the trouble certainly did not originate with me. More than one activist has used a similar call to action. I lift up you know, civil rights leader, John Lewis, who called on young people, right? To get in good trouble. That is to find a way to get in the way, to push for transformation and to agitate for reform. And I have to say, I'm probably one of the older members of Prince of Gadsden Creek. The energy, it is the energy of our of our young people, like, like Mika. Um, it's just phenomenal. And then, you know, feminist Donna Haraway uses the term staying with the trouble. And when she uses that term, she's talking about the development of a kinship with the more than human world. And this is surely what the salmon speakers have achieved with their magnificent work to preserve and protect their brethren, the salmon. So ever since the permit to destroy Gadsden Creek was submitted by the developer, the the members of the Friends of Gadsden Creek have made good trouble, stayed with the trouble, lifting up the Press Creek and the African American community's inherent resilience. It is not okay to call this community a victim. They have a profound inherent resilience. And when people find out about the history of the takings from this African-American community and a critical wetland named Gadsden Creek, which long sustained them, their first reaction very often is, oh my gosh, they're shocked. But then as Mika will say, and I will say, and all of us will say, having empathy for a situation is simply not enough. Right. It is through our art that we and the salmon speakers, and I wrote this down so I didn't mess it up, we have sought to translate information and empathy into action to restore, protect, celebrate, and above all, resist. It is through our art that we trouble, as in to trouble, as in a verb, as in an action verb, that we seek to tap in to the resilience of a salt marsh that can grow up straight through the asphalt and a fish that always knows the way home. We are all teachers and all learners. And I wanna share with you one of the most powerful messages that I have ever seen as 
a teacher, and I came across it from the work of scholar and urban educator Christopher Emden. And he cites Harold Melvin, Helvin and the Blue Notes in his song, Wake Up, Everybody. Wake up, everybody. Time to treat, teach in a new way. Maybe then they'll listen to what you have to say. Wake up, everybody. No more sleeping in bed. No more backward thinking. Time for thinking ahead. The world won't get no better if we just let it be. The world won't get no better. We got to change it, yeah just you and me. It's hard to say it any better than that. I agree. That's one of my favorite songs. Um, and one of the things- Isn't I'm, it amazing? It's amazing. I was like, it's amazing record, Teddy Pendergrass on lead. The thing, the thing yeah. that you said that's gonna stick with me is empathy into action. Being empathetic is good, but it is not enough. Empathy into action. Um, I, Mika, Tiz, Mary, I had such a really good time talking to you all today. Um, I look forward to seeing what's next for your teams. Your collaborative and thoughtful work is incredibly valued, not only to the communities that you serve, but also to the sector, and it's much needed. And beyond that, I'm happy to congratulate you all once again on your well-deserved award for Outstanding Artist. Uh, thank you all for pushing the boundaries of, of what is possible and for continually fighting for equity. Your work is incredibly necessary and it brings me great happiness as a black man to celebrate your teams as the first ever Outstanding Artist Water Prize winners. So I want to thank you all for, for lending us your time today and thank you for the work that you all continue to do. I look forward to seeing you all stay with the trouble. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Benny. Thank you, Benny. Tis, Mary, and Tamika, it's so exciting to award two winners for the Outstanding Artist Award this year. We are deeply inspired by the important work you are all doing. Our final discussion today will be moderated by Tim Eater, Program Officer for the Environment for the Mott Foundation. Tim manages a grant-making portfolio that addresses freshwater challenges with a focus on the Great Lakes and has been a longtime friend and supporter of the U.S. Water Alliance. He is joined today by three incredible leaders in the water sector. Representing San Juan Bay Estuary Program, winner of the U.S. Water Prize for Outstanding Nonprofit Organization, is Brenda Torres Barreto, Executive Director of San Juan Bay Estuary Program, also known as Estuario. Brenda has vast experience in environmental management, corporate social responsibility, and development of public policy. Dr. Lindsay Burt, winner of the U.S. Water Prize for Outstanding Rising One Water Leader, serves as Client Solutions Manager for Xylem Inc. Lindsay has extensive experience in digital intelligence for water and wastewater networks and completed her PhD in agricultural and biological engineering. And representing Microsoft, winner of the U.S. Water Prize for Outstanding Private Sector Organization is Dr. Lucas Joppa, Microsoft's first Chief Environmental Officer. With a PhD in ecology from Duke University and recognition by Fortune Magazine in its 40 under 40 list, UCAS is a uniquely accredited voice for sustainability in the tech industry. Well, great. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. And I just want to join Sarah and the U.S. Water Alliance in congratulating the winners of the water prizes this, this year. I'm excited to speak with these three individuals and le learn more about what drives them as leaders. From water conservation to community-led restoration to agricultural engineering, today's panelists are tackling our nation's challenges in different ways, but they each share a passion for developing solutions and building a more sustainable water future. I have three questions that I'm gonna to ask to get their perspectives on, so let's dive right in. Uh, let me start by asking you, Lucas, uh, can you tell us more about your work at Microsoft and what inspired you to pursue a career in sustainability? Sure, and thanks so much for, for having me and, and Microsoft here. Um, so I'm the Chief Environmental Officer at Microsoft, which means that I oversee our global environmental sustainability strategy and execution across our worldwide business. We focus on four areas, carbon, water, waste, and ecosystems. And we have transitioned from really critical work in setting what we hope to be industry-leading strategies 
um, to be a carbon negative, water positive, zero waste company that's protecting more land than we use to delivering industry leading results against those commitments. And so we set those commitments about a year ago, we're a year into, um, into our execution. And so I oversee all of our sustainability activities from our operations to the way that we think about engineering new products and services, customer engagement, policy, advocacy, and employee empowerment as well. So it's a whole lot of fun. I got into it because um, I just have, as a person, I've always been fascinated by the way the world works. That's where everything kind of got started for me. If I had to choose between inside and outside, I always chose outside. Um, and then I just, as you start spending time studying environmental systems, there's no way that you can avoid observing and then becoming worried about the impact of human activities on those natural systems and then the forthcoming detrimental impact on humans because of that degradation of our environment. And so that's what got me into um, where I am today. It started with a passion for nature and then transitioned into kind of a, a worry <laughs> about people and, and then a desire to try to do something about it. So that's why we are where we are today. That's great, Lucas. Thank you very much. And and Lindsay, um, how about you? Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on at Xylem and what inspired you to pursue a career in water? Yes. So I am a client solutions manager for Xylem covering the upper Midwest region of the United States. And I partner closely with utility leaders and an agriculture sector to help them solve their most pressing water challenges and achieve transformative outcomes. And so at Xylem, we bring together our clients' data and experience and our best-in-class digital solutions to, to provide deep industry expertise to help unlock uh, these powerful insights in these water systems that we're managing and actionable guidance to drive value for the communities they serve. An interesting story. Um, since the time my mother took me to mommy and me swim classes, I will say I fell in love with water. <laughs> and growing up in the rural suburbs of Southeast Texas, um, as I began to grow up, I saw the impact of our local environment uh, because of urban sprawl, increase in previous surfaces, and my quiet little sanctuary of a playground that led to um, increased street flooding, hurricanes, polluted creeks and bayous, and more concrete. And so I think my experiences growing up play a pivotal role in my interest to help others in solving water. That's pretty cool. I think we can all relate to our formative years and the influence that it had on our careers. Uh, so Brenda, if you could round us out, can you tell us a little bit more about what your team is working on at Estuario and what inspired you to pursue a career in water? Sure, team. And I also want to say before I, I answer the question that I'm truly um, thankful for the U.S. Water Alliance for this great recognition. My team, my entire team and the board of directors is also super excited. Um, this team is a very diverse one. Uh, we are, we're very uh, busy uh, working with a new reality at the moment. Um, as you know, we're based in Puerto Rico, an island in the Caribbean. We're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we've been in operation for the past 27 years. And we're part of the U.S. Um, national estuary programs created by the Clean Water Act. There are 28 national estuary programs in the nation, and we are the only one outside of the continental U.S. and in the tropical, within a tropical system. So right now, my, my team is, is currently pushing forward a very robust agenda to finally um, and hopefully uh, restore the quality of the waters in the metropolitan region of Puerto Rico. It's a region that is highly urbanized, um, leaving 600,000 people approximately um, it's housed at this um, international airport. Um, tourists come through the San Juan um, Bay um, region through the, um, you know, the, the, the cruise ships and, and pl by plane as well. Um, it is a very active region, but it very um, as well impermeabilized. So basically, we need to um, come up with a very, you know, execution of very innovative projects and, and also the empowerment of these communities.
communities so we can come up with uh, very, um, you know, um, important projects for, for the future. You want to tell us what inspired you? How did you get started? So um, basically, my, my, I've been a social ecologist, I think, my entire life. I um, did um, my undergrads in environmental science, and then I moved to work on, on environmental policy as well. And then from there, I had the experience of managing nonprofit organizations, and that nonprofit organization opportunity allowed me to understand, fully understand, how important it is to really um, address the environmental issues through a comprehensive platform. And I think that the water is, from my perspective, this first layer that needs to be um, attended, needs to be addressed in order for, uh, for us to be absolutely um, sustainable in the future. So, you know, that value of water, um, from my perspective, is what really drives my career throughout these years. Super, thank you. Uh, so, Lindsay, um, over to you. Um, so, over the course of your career, uh, how has your work changed and what trends do you see shaping water work in the next five years or so? Yeah, great question, Tim. Um, this past year, you know, during this past year, it's really been unprecedented um, social unjust economics and our environment as well. And so one thing is clear to me, everyone needs water. In order to solve the biggest water challenges, uh, I believe we're moving towards multi-sector collaborative partnerships. And that's going to be critical in creating innovative uh, technologies and solutions, shaping our culture, and really developing vision setting for a one water solutions. Um, and I also see that there is a big trend in digital technologies, digital water intelligence, low-cost real-time sensors, uh, digital twins of our water systems, whether it be urban, agriculture, small systems, large systems. Uh, we're gonna see a bigger growth in usage of machine learning, uh, real-time decision support. And I also think there's that social factor too. Water equity is um, a growing trend. We're not only seeing it now, but we're, it's a call from our younger professionals that we need to integrate environmental justice and equity in our water solutions. It's pertinent. It may not be in our traditional engineering and science curriculum, but they're seeking us to help collaborate in addressing water and the totality of water challenges in a one water approach. Yeah, that's great. I think we've all seen the impact of that of that social change on our on our work. I appreciate you raising that. Um, so, Brenda, how has Estuario's work changed in the past few years and what trends do you see over the next few years? Yes, so Astoria, as I mentioned, has been in operation for 25, 27 years, and I see um, the transition of Astoria as the before Maria and after Maria. So right before Maria, um, which um, really hit the island in 2017, September of 2017, the Astoria has been like, you know, constantly pushing forward this agenda to restore the quality of the waters, integrating stakeholders, um, you know, educating the community, educating those that are developing public policy. Um, and really, we, we, we were in a way advancing and we had great, you know, great plans. Uh, but then Maria hit us and, and it was just incredible the way it, within 24 hours, the, the entire island uh, was transformed. And you know, this is a reality for many islands as well, and many areas in, in the United States as well. So it is, it is that moment in time when you think, wait a minute, am I, am I, was I doing the right thing? What do I have to do to really uh, bring more support or be instrumental in this moment? So we took actually um, the climate change adaptation plan that we had developed prior to Maria and transformed that into a relief campaign. And from there, you know, with no power, um, no electricity, and no way for us to communicate with others, we got in touch with the community and, and then from there start from zero. Um, and then after that situation happened, um, Estuario has been developing some critical projects um, in order for us to um, see and construct a more resilient Puerto Rico. 
Uh, but you know, in in a in a if, if I were to summarize it, um, I would say that Puerto, Puerto Rico has um, lots of funding, federal funding, to reconstruct. Um, and so my worry at the moment, and the worry from my team, is that we use the money wisely. That the money is spent for you know to develop resilient water infrastructure. Um, we're talking about $90 billion that were provided to Puerto Rico to reconstruct the island. Um, and not to mention the rest of the funding that is coming for, for COVID or for the earthquakes that have been happening. And so my role is to really make sure that whatever we do, we develop, is used um, wisely and is actually doing good for those disadvantaged communities, for, for, the, for the social and economic benefit of the island. That's a huge challenge, $90 billion. Wow. Uh, Lucas, same question. How has Microsoft work been changing in recent years and what trends do you see shaping water work in the years to come? Well, I think the simplest way to explain the trend in, in Microsoft is our eyes have just become you know, more and more open every year to the severity of the water crisis, right? We started as a small software company and became a larger software company and then became a cloud computing uh, company. And as all of that work happened, it wasn't immediately obvious to us in our early days, you know, what the water impact of our work was or how water directly influenced our operations. And then as we matured in our business capabilities, it just became more and more obvious. We started working on reducing water within our own operations, then in certain areas in water stress regions of the world like Silicon Valley, we started really investing in water um, recycling technologies inside of our campuses so that, for instance, we're, we're no longer drawing from municipal water sources for anything other than drinking water inside some of our uh, facilities. But it was about a year ago that we really just stepped back and looked at the global footprint of our operations and looked at the severity of the overall water crisis. And that's when we came up with our water positive commitment, a commitment to replenish more water than we consume globally, but to really only do that replenishment in water stressed regions of the world in which we operate. And I think that that really uh, highlights just the this lo the really locality based issues of water that you know everybody's got a water problem but everybody's problem is different um, and and going and being able to execute that at, at scale for us is just a, a really big deal and so we have this this commitment to replenish more water than than we use in water stress regions but we also have an accessibility commitment to provide access to water. Um, for more than 1.5 million people by by the year 2030, and we're on track for both of those um, for both of those commitments. But as as you can see, I think from that journey, as I said, it's just more and more awareness of the severity of water issues in all of the regions in in which we operate, and I think the trends that we see are pretty obvious. Maybe it's some confirmation bias uh, happening here, but we see digitization of water systems as a really big um, uh, trend, a really big opportunity and a really big need. I think this our water crisis has been kind of hidden for so long because water systems are hidden in many respects. Um, and the more that we can digitize those systems, the more that we can better manage them. And then I do also think that this, this growing recognition of water as a collective action problem that we all need to start working together is just something that we'll, we'll see continuing to grow. It's something that Microsoft does a lot of, of trying to bring organizations together to really um, ensure that the impact that we're having in any particular region is as big as possible from a positive side. Great. Thanks, Great. Lucas. So um, final question, and um, I'm going to start with you, Brenda. Are there certain people or communities that inspire you and your team and your leadership that 
drive your innovation and dedication? And can you tell us a little bit about those folks? Um, yes, I, um, you know, I find I found, uh, you know, inspiration uh, from from the community leaders that are managing their own agenda at the community based level. Um, these, these community leaders have suffered, uh, but at the same time, they're truly empowered, um, always intrigued by the system, how everything works, what is it that we're, you know, what's happening here in my, in my community, how, how bad the situation is, and they sit at the table and they discuss things with you that helps you really develop the agenda uh, and that we're, those work plans with them. Um, I have to say that um, what we work is, is, as I mentioned, is an area that is highly urbanized. And in one particular corner of this of this entire Estoran system, there there are 3.7 mile long channel that is clogged with debris, and around 30,000 people live surrounding this community. Um, this area gets flooded by just light rain. Um, and the people living there really suffer. They, they lose days, uh, work days. Uh, the children stop their educational programs because they, you know, no schools no. Are, are, are open. So it's really a very stressful moment for, for these communities. And my mom actually was born and raised in one of these communities. Um, so up until the age of 13, I used to go there every weekend and spend time with my grandparents and really experience firsthand what these people have to go through. And I also experienced how these people were in a way frustrated, you know, by, by this situation and always at the dinner table, you know, discussing these situations and coming up with like, okay, what is it that we're going to do tomorrow to fix this situation? Um, so I saw how they are um, armed, but at the same time have the courage to really do something. Right now, these community leaders, I am honored to be working with them after being raised in a way by, by, this, by them as, as one of their, their residents and neighbors. Um, and, I, and I feel that they are truly the ones that are that have to really run these agendas. As I mentioned, you know, when we had that horrible experience by Hurricane Maria, that the infrastructure collapsed, right? The ones that were there to support each other and to, you know, raise and, and continue to move forward with them, you know, the community leaders. So from my perspective, um, if we make sure that there is knowledge transfer, um, we will be able to come up with innovative solutions and great projects and, and eventually a, a better future for these communities that are really um, in underserved regions and for the entire island of Puerto Rico in my case. Super, thank you. Um, we do need to move along, but I, I also want to hear from Lucas and Lindsay. So Lucas, what inspires you and your leadership? Well, I think I'll go back and say what inspired me, actually. I, I grew up in Wisconsin, uh, in the United States, a land of many, many, many lakes, and I never took them for granted until I took my first course at the University of Wisconsin-Madison on limnology and the study of inland uh, lakes and, and streams. And I just had multiple professors that really infected me, I think, with the incredible complexity of aquatic systems and just the incredible importance of water to human societies and how little most people think about it. And that just was kind of a, a turning of the mind for me to realize that I'd spent my whole life never thinking about water systems and how incredibly interesting they actually are and how important they are. And that just opened my mind. And now I, I have the opportunity to work with uh, incredible people all around the world dedicating their careers to, to water systems. And so for me, it's just a, a huge honor to be able to be involved in some of their work. Great, thanks. And um, finally, Lindsay, you, 
um, close us out, if you would, today. What's the major source of inspiration for you? Yes. Yeah, so, Tim, well, I recognized while I was working on my Ph.D. in agriculture and biological engineering with a focus in watershed management, it truly takes a village, or in my case, a watershed of people to raise up a one water leader. And so my major source of inspiration is my faith, my family, my church family, and my watershed of mentors. And I'm also so grateful for the U.S. Water Alliance and being a part of the rising professional cohort and the Alliance staff because they really encouraged me to continue to be my authentic self, to truly stay uh, true to my passion and mission and continue to increase diversity and equity in water and to tell my story. And so I'm just very grateful and thank you for this opportunity to be here with Lucas and Brenda and share with you a little bit of my story and my inspiration, my watershed group of uh, people in my life. That's terrific. Thanks, Lindsay. Well, I wish we had more time. Um, and I just want to, again, congratulate all three of you on your impressive accomplishments, the challenges that you're undertaking in the years ahead. And, and thank you so much on behalf of the U.S. Water Alliance for your leadership. And I think we all look forward to seeing how your work evolves and what comes next for the three of you and your organizations. Thanks again. And again, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, Brenda, Lindsay, and Lucas. It's so wonderful to see you driving a one water future for generations to come. On behalf of the U.S. Water Alliance team, I wanna thank you all who have tuned in live for today's celebration. I hope you've enjoyed hearing from this year's U.S. Water Prize winners as much as I have. It's been a pleasure getting to know these outstanding leaders better and congratulations again from the whole Alliance team on your many accomplishments. <music>